Welcome to the History of European Theatre podcast and thanks for joining me on this journey through millennia of theatrical history. Episode 119, Imagining Shakespeare's Wife. For this episode, I'm very pleased to welcome Catherine Shile, Professor of English at the University of Minnesota. Catherine is author of several books about Shakespeare, but today we're particularly talking about her book about Shakespeare's wife called Imagining Shakespeare's Wife, The Afterlife of Anne Hathaway. It's a fascinating examination of the known facts of Anne's life and how her persona has been used and abused throughout the centuries as a means of examining and justifying views about Shakespeare, but also about how Anne has been viewed in her own right. Catherine is a leading expert on Anne Hathaway and her legacy to history, so following on from the last podcast episode about Shakespeare's early life and marriage, this was a perfect opportunity to talk to Catherine who adds much nuanced thought and detail to the subject of Anne's life, which adds to the basic facts that I detailed here last time. So, if you haven't listened to that episode yet, it's probably a good idea to go back and do so before returning here. I talked to Catherine from her home in Minnesota over Zoom, and in this first part of our conversation, Catherine took me through the facts of Anne's life up to her death in 1623 and the manner and significance of her burial in the Holy Trinity Church in Stratford-upon-Avon. I started by asking Catherine what had drawn her to write about Shakespeare's wife and her afterlife. My 2018 book, Imagining Shakespeare's Wife, The Afterlife of Anne Hathaway, actually began in my Shakespeare classroom. I was teaching a class called Shakespeare and After, which was... um, works inspired by Shakespeare and and related topics. And we did a unit that combined a Shakespeare novel, the novel Will by Grace Tiffany. And we read that alongside a biography of Shakespeare, which was Stephen Greenblatt's Will in the World. And somewhat randomly, I chose the meeting of Anne and William and the subsequent marriage as just a life episode for my students to read in each work and compare. The students were mortified at the amount of fiction in Stephen Greenblatt's biography. Um, And uh, they were just totally taken aback at the version of Anne in that book and the amount of imaginative uh, energy that went into it. So um, I'll just read you a little excerpt of that to give you the flavor of of what that fictional uh, interpretation looks like. Um, So just to set this up, also, Will in the World came out in 2004, reissued in 2016, and it's still widely available. Um, So the chapter about the Shakespeare marriage is called Wooing, Wedding, and Repenting, uh, a line repurposed from Much Ado About Nothing. So you you kind of get the argument about the Shakespeare marriage just (laughs) title, right? So here's how the marriage and relationship between the Shakespeare's is described. Shakespeare must abandon his disastrous mistake of a wife. He was dragged to the altar. He viewed Anne with distaste and contempt. He experienced the frustrated longing for spousal intimacy. He felt sour anger to Anne and a strange, ineradicable distaste for her that he felt deep within him. So that, that's all uh, pretty fantastical and intensely negative. Um, And the reaction of my students and and actually my own reaction to this started me thinking about what are the pieces of Anne's life that exist and how could they possibly be put together in such a way to produce this really hideous nightmare version of a wife. That was the inspiration behind this book. And I started to thinking thinking about how are these pieces of evidence privileged and other pieces suppressed and then fiction added to that to produce a particular Anne. So the first part of the book is an exploration of what we know about Anne, what's the surviving evidence about her. And then the second part talks about how those pieces of her life have been combined in various ways, embellished and suppressed, usually with the aim of producing a particular version of Shakespeare. Yes, I noticed in the appendix to your book, uh, you listed the works of biography or criticism uh, that Anne features in significantly over the years, 61 of them. And then you also list works of fiction that she appears in, 74 of them, which I guess is significant in itself. 
But then we come to the actual factual evidence that exists for her. I mean, there are you list eight pieces of surviving evidence about Anne. So how do you how do you weigh those pieces up against all of this work that has been extrapolated from them? Right, right. That's a good question. Well, uh, so you've already mentioned the marriage between Anne and William in a previous episode. So it, in terms of items of evidence, I'll just say a, a little bit to add to that. Uh, Anne was 26 and William was 18. So those ages are not that unusual, except that the it was usually the reverse. Hmm. Anne was probably pregnant at the time. And as you might imagine, uh, a lot of fiction has been written about that. What were the circumstances? What was the relationship? Was she a predatory older woman entrapping a younger man, uh, et cetera? So they married in November of 1582. Daughter Susanna was born in May of 1583. It was also a marriage between uh, two families that had well-established relationships. So um, the fathers, uh, Shakespeare's father and Anne's father, were probably close friends. So it it's not necessarily the case that this was a shotgun marriage that mm -hmm. came about because of, you know, a, a one night stand or something like that. I mean, it may have been. But you know, there are a lot of other possibilities. Yeah. So if we look at some of the other major pieces of surviving evidence, I think that that word surviving evidence is key because um, one of the things that I think is, is really crucial about imagining the life of someone like Anne is that we don't have all of the evidence that once existed about her life. So even when we're looking at combining the surviving pieces of evidence, um, we don't have a full picture. And just because something doesn't survive doesn't mean that it didn't exist. One thing that has survived, um, I think we're all thankful for this, is uh, Anne Hathaway's cottage. Oh, yes, indeed. <laughs> right. So this has been a major piece in how she's constructed uh, and imagined. So the, the space was originally called Hewlands, and it's in the nearby village of Shottery, Owned by the Hathaway family starting in 1610, when Anne's brother Bartholomew Hathaway purchased it, the deed was drawn up by Shakespeare's lawyer, Francis Collins. So that's another connection between the two families. But the Hathaway family had lived in the space uh, for much longer before that. Anne Hathaway's cottage uh, was occupied by the Hathaway family until the end of the 19th century. So. The tourist trade that developed in Stratford, at least at Anne Hathaway's cottage, was managed by the Hathaway family descendants. The most um, renowned one was a woman named Mary Baker, who was a, a distant relative of Anne's. And she, for most of the second half of the 19th century, led tours of the Hathaway family home. She lived in the Hathaway family home with her family. Um, and she died on, not on the cottage steps, but she slipped on the cottage steps. And that was the, the sort of final thing. And I like to think she would have been happy about that way to go. Yep. So. <laughs> She's certainly an incredible character. It comes out in your book, what, what an amazing character she was and what she did for Stratford tourist industry that was just beginning to grow up then. Uh, they can never thank her enough, I think. Yeah, exactly. And if you go to Anne Hathaway's cottage today, the tour that the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust does maintains pretty much the same narrative that Mary Baker set up. So in Mary Baker's day, she would have visitors sit at the courting settle and imagine how William and Anne uh, had their courtship. She would give out sprigs of rosemary for remembrance. So if you think about the gardens at Anne Hathaway's cottage that are still there. That's part of the legacy that Mary Baker started. Uh, she would also show visitors the Hathaway family Bible and trace her lineage back to Anne. And then even some select visitors got to spend the night in the, co in the cottage. Mm. So I'm still waiting for the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust to offer that option. <laughs> um, probably unlikely. Mm, probably. Right. But the fact that that physical space survives in pretty much the same, not condition, but the same um, semblance that it did in Anne's life has had just a massive uh, influence on her afterlife. Right. And 
this space has been replicated elsewhere. So there's one uh, close to me here in, uh, in the neighboring state of South Dakota. There's one in Asheville, North Carolina at the Grove Park Inn, um, among many other replicas of this space. So I think the, the domestic space, that's um, kind of the quintessential English cottage has had broad appeal to people for centuries. Yes, this is something I really didn't appreciate until I read your book, but these Anne Hathaway cottages over the world, it's, it's quite a thing. Right. And if you think about it, I mean, it's a, it's a beautiful space, but it's really as the, the, the only surviving space connected to Anne, um, it's trapped her in a way in a domestic role and right. also in the courtship aspect of her life. So it's yes. like she's eternally preserved in the courtship narratives of Shakespeare walking across the fields to Shottery and courting her. Um, but that's like a fraction of her, her actual life. Yes, uh, I guess we, we might come on to later so the way some writers have tried to take her away from that in, in quite dramatic ways, um, some of them. If we think about the se a second piece of evidence about Anne, that would be New Place. Mm -hmm. That's the home that Shakespeare purchased in Stratford in 1597. But yeah. the space itself doesn't survive. It was demolished in 1759 by Reverend Francis Gastrell, who infamously got tired of tourists coming and carving off a piece of the mulberry tree, et cetera. So that's been a, a massive, uh, that's had a massive effect on Anne's afterlife, because if that space survived and we could imagine her in that space, I think we'd have a lot of very different stories. So it was the second largest house in Stratford. It had 20 rooms and 10 fireplaces. That's that's the estimate. Anne would have been the mistress of New Place, living there with her daughters, Judith and Susanna, until they married with Shakespeare's parents, probably with his brothers, Gilbert and Richard, um, all while her husband was away in London. There's also been recent archaeological work at New Place that's discovered the remains of cottage industries, uh, mainly textile working at New Place, but I think more importantly, a brewing business. Mm -hmm. That would have been run by Anne. Um, Stratford in that period was one of the brewing capitals um, of the area. So Lena Orlin actually argues that the Shakespeare's were a dual income family, that Shakespeare was earning his keep in the London theater world, and Anne was managing the brewing business at Stratford. Right. I think if place as a physical structure survived and visitors could go through and see um, replicas of this brewing business, we would imagine Anne in a much more responsible position than as just the, the object of courtship that you get from Anne Hathaway's cottage. New place also, if you think about uh, Shakespeare's life there with 20 rooms and 10 fireplaces it makes it much more likely that Shakespeare did some of his writing in Stratford so Stanley Wells calls Shakespeare the first literary commuter Shakespeare <laughs> never lived in a place in London that he owned it was always right. a rented mm. space and it doesn't make a lot of sense that he wouldn't have spent as much time in new place as possible from 1597 on and if Anne is living in New Place with their family, I think there are a lot of things that, that we might rethink about the influence on Shakespeare's plays of the Strat not only the Stratford area, but the people in that community. So we don't have evidence that Shakespeare went back to Stratford regularly, but we, we don't have evidence that he didn't either. Correct. Right. Um, and, and again, that's the problem with the lack of surviving evidence. Um, most biographers like to think, well, of course, Shakespeare went back to Stratford for the death of his only son, Hamnet. There's zero evidence that he did. But, you know, it, it seems inconceivable that, you know, he wouldn't have been part of that. But we just don't know. Yeah, absolutely. There's mm. nothing to say that he was there or not. I think also if uh, in terms of inspiration for Shakespeare's creativity, if you think about uh, a film like Shakespeare in Love, for example, mm -hmm. that tells the story of Shakespeare being influenced by the whole London setting and, you know, the noble woman that he supposedly had a, um, a relationship with. Um, if you reposition him in Stratford, there are all sorts of other creative influences that uh, come into play outside of him, you know, needing to have 
uh, affairs or relationships with other people in London. So I think the the destruction of New Place in the 18th century was just a really consequential um, act on not only Shakespeare's life story, but especially Anne's. I don't think we can escape without talking about Shakespeare's will as a piece <laughs> of surviving evidence. You're going to mention the bed, the second best bed, <laughs> aren't you? We can't avoid it. Yeah, no, just, let's go for it. So the bequest in Shakespeare's will, the line is, I give unto my wife my second best bed with the furniture. And those 12 words have been really emphasized way out of their importance in terms of uh, ideas of Shakespeare's relationship uh, with Anne. Lena Orlin in her book, The Private Life of William Shakespeare, has definitively shown that second best was not an insult, that the first best bed was the bed that you would give to guests, and then mm -hmm. the second best bed would have been your marital bed, or as one of my students described it, the second most comfortable bed. <laughs> <laughs> Lena has also shown that our, there were lots of wills with bequests of not only second best beds, but third best, fourth best, fifth best beds, et cetera, not as insults, but as specific terms for specific beds. So the second best is description is a problem in the will because it allows biographers and, and other writers to say, well, Shakespeare's trying to diss his wife, as, as we would say today, um, by giving her kind of a cast off um, piece of furniture. But that, that just doesn't uh, accord with interpretations of second best in the period. The other problem with that line in the will is it's interlineated, meaning it was added in. So that's also allowed biographers and other writers to say, well, Shakespeare forgot about his wife. Famously, Edmund Malone, the 18th century editor, um, said Shakespeare forgot about his wife and then added in an insult to her at the last minute. Um, but there are also other ways to interpret that too. So Francis Collins, Shakespeare's clerk, was known to have made a lot of mistakes in various um, copying of, of documents. Um, it's not even clear that Shakespeare himself was dictating the will and then forgot this second best bet. It very well could be it was recopied and that line was forgotten. So we, we just don't know right. how right. that line ended up to be interlineated. And I think it was Malone's interpretation that was terribly influential um, yes. uh, immediately after he published it. So, and that's really taken a long time um, for scholarship to lean in a different direction. Right. So it's, it's just been massively influential. Um, and if you're trying to make a case, kind of worst case interpretation of Anne, that's where you go, is the mm. second bed, bed, the interlineated line too, because... You can make the case that Shakespeare forgot about her, added this back in, and then, you know, has for posterity given us a, an insult. But that just, uh, that, that's a very narrow way of reading it. Um, and also, if you're making that interpretation of Anne as this disastrous mistake, that's the uh, interpretation from Stephen Greenblatt's Will in the World, you have to ignore what I think is the most important piece about Anne, and that is the epitaph on her grave. In Holy Trinity Church. Anne's buried in Holy Trinity Church in Stratford upon Avon. Her grave is just to the left of Shakespeare's. So if you're standing in Holy Trinity facing the altar, on the left on the wall is Shakespeare's monument. And then across the chancel steps, first is Anne's grave, then Shakespeare's grave, and then three other graves of the Shakespeare family. So to the right of Shakespeare is Thomas Nash. That's the husband of uh, Shakespeare and Anne's granddaughter, Elizabeth, the first mm -hmm. husband. And then after Thomas Nash is John Hall. That's their daughter, Susanna's husband. And then the final grave at the right end is Susanna Hall. So there are a lot of significant things about Anne's burial and her epitaph. So first of all, Anne had a chancel burial. So after Shakespeare, she's the first member, member of the Shakespeare family to be buried on the chancel steps. And Robert Bierman has shown that chancel burials were something that had to be paid for, that it wasn't automatically given to uh, tithe owners. 
This means that Anne's surviving family members had to pay for this burial in a significant space of the church. And then the burial of Anne in that space established the rest of the Shakespeare graves as like a family plot. Anne's grave also is the only one of the Shakespeare family graves that's commemorated with a brass plaque that has an original Latin epitaph written by her daughters, Susanna and Judith. And I think the, this Latin part of the epitaph is really significant. So it dates from not long after Anne's death, as early as 1634, William Dugdale records it in his notes. And it's really the most reliable piece of evidence about her because if you date it from 1634, family members were still alive at the time and would have created this this beautiful piece of Latin poetry. So it's, Mm. I think, highly accurate, at least in terms of how Anne's family felt about her. It starts out with an English part, which is pretty much boilerplate. You can find just dozens of brass epitaphs like this. So the English part says, here lieth interred the body of Anne, wife of William Shakespeare, who departed this life the 6th day of August, 1623, being of the age of 67 years. Hmm. That's the standard part. But we we might note that she's described as the wife of William Shakespeare. Yes. So, um, you know, deliberately calling that out. But then the Latin part is really the significant piece. So I'll just read the English translation of that. Mother, thou gavest me the breast, thou gavest me milk and life. Woe is me for so great a gift, my return will be but a tomb. Would that the good angel would roll away the stone from its mouth, that thy form, like the body of Christ, might come forth. Yet my prayers are of no avail. O Christ, come quickly, that my mother, even though shut in the tomb, may rise again and seek the stars. So it's a beautiful testimony to Anne's importance to her family and also to her as a pious and beloved mother. Before we get into the content, I think it's worth pointing out that the choice of Latin is really significant. Um, That was an elevated language uh, at the time. So in addition to an epitaph in brass and a burial spot in a privileged space on the chancel steps, Anne's daughters also chose to memorialize her in Latin. So when we think about whether Anne was literate or not, or educated or not, I think the choice of Latin is significant because um, we have no idea if Anne could read Latin or not, that Mm. there's no evidence that survives one way or or another about Mm. that. But I think choosing to memorialize her in an elevated language at least attests to her, her value to her family. Yeah, you can cer- certainly hear the, the pain of a daughter's loss in those words, can't you? It's quite striking. Right. And then the line, you gave me the breast, that's really significant um, in terms of Anne as a breastfeeding mother. So, of course, we know the health benefits of breastfeeding, but also mm-hmm. in Anne's day, breastfeeding had a, a huge moral significance, too. William Gouge in his 1621 of Domestical Duties considered breastfeeding a testimony of love and an example of the admirable work of God's providence. John Dodd and Robert Cleaver in a godly form of household government from 1598 and reprinted 1621 described a good mother as one who nursed her own children. Elizabeth Clinton in 1622 put it more bluntly, breast milk comes from direct providence of God. So this, there was this idea that a mother's virtuous character was transmitted through her breast milk. So to describe Anne as a breastfeeding mother wasn't just, you know, this was something healthy to do. Mm. There was a moral significance to that as well. Judith and Susanna, Anne's daughters, were both mothers at the time of Anne's death and at the time that this epitaph would have been created. So they also must have appreciated putting this tribute to motherhood and, you know, the morality of their mother between those two memorials to their famous father. So Shakespeare's monument on the wall, you know, with the quill pen in his hand, and then Anne's memorial as a moral, pious mother described as so great a gift. (laughs) 
and then to the right of her, Shakespeare's own grave. So I think this tribute to Anne as a mother in an important place in her parish church was was really significant. Yes, that's it's really striking. As you said earlier, the a power couple, even in death. Right. Now, I think this is the absolutely most significant piece of evidence that survives about Anne's life, but there's been a long history of various writers suppressing this for mm -hmm. a variety of reasons, um, in part because it makes a, such a strong case for Anne as a powerful woman who was beloved by her family and her community. Now, Anne dies in 1623, so of course we don't know how Shakespeare himself felt about her or if the epitaph has any remnants of Shakespeare's own feelings about his wife, but you can definitely mm -hmm. say that her surviving family felt that she was a beloved uh, part of the family and of the community. But again, starting in the 18th century, this epitaph has a long history of being suppressed and um, really ignored. So there's a sketch from 1737 done by George Virtue of Shakespeare's grave and monument. This beautiful Latin poem is just replaced with the single word wife. And there's a male visitor standing on Anne's grave in order to get a better view of Shakespeare's monument. In 1795, Samuel Ireland did an illustration of the Shakespeare graves. Uh, and Anne's grave is replaced entirely with another version of Shakespeare's graves. So she isn't even represented. Then the 18th century editor Edmund Malone, who we've talked about a few minutes ago, reprints just the English part. And then he declares, after this inscription follow six Latin verses not worth preserving. And then in Stephen Greenblatt's biography, Will in the World, he calls this epitaph a strange inscription. So I think if you're going to make an interpretation of Anne that's negative, you have to deal with this epitaph. You know, so how, how do you work this epitaph describing Anne as so great a gift and giving her these moral characteristics if you're going to describe her as a disastrous mistake of a wife? My thanks to Catherine for her time and sharing such fascinating insights with us. You can find full details of Catherine's work in the show notes and on the guest page of the website. Her book, Imagining Shakespeare's Wife, The Afterlife of Anne Hathaway, is published by Cambridge University Press and available direct from them or from any bookseller, big or small. Catherine has also co-edited a collection of poetry inspired by Anne Hathaway called The Anthology, which is one of the things that we will discuss when she returns to talk about the afterlife of Anne. That's in a couple of episodes time, but next time the Shakespeare biography continues with Shakespeare's burgeoning career and his time in London. In the meantime, please join the Facebook page or group or find the podcast on Instagram or X just to keep up to date with new episodes. If you feel able to help out with the costs of running the podcast, then please head over to Patreon where you will find additional content for a small monthly fee or a one-off donation. New Patreon episodes relating to this season are appearing regularly, where currently I'm looking at criticism and appreciation of Shakespeare through the centuries. By signing up for full membership, you also get access to the catalogue of back episodes, so plenty to listen to there in addition to the main podcast. You can find details or ways to support the podcast at the website, which is www.thehistoryofeuropeantheatre.com. I look forward to your company next time, but if you have any comments or concerns in the meantime, you can contact me by email at thoetp at gmail.com or via x at thoetp. Mm -hmm.